Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Strong. I'm co-owner and director of Racing Magpie here in Rapid City, South Dakota. On behalf of our entire team, I want to welcome everyone to an exciting presentation that's part of our new program this winter called Winter Camp. Today, we've got Keith Braveheart presenting his talk called Metitakuyapi. <laughs> Pardon my Lakota pronunciation. It's, uh, I'm still learning. Uh, Kicha, an arts presentation and talk. Uh, at Racing Magpie, we're dedicated to elevating and amplifying Native artists and their communities through educational, cultural, and research programs, all in the Lakota spirit of being a good relative. Uh, as part of that being a good relative, this program will reimagine the Lakota winter camp model of problem solving and community building in today's world by examining the deeper reasons why Lakota people do things the way they do and, and how they interact with the world around them and the universe around them. Uh, these events are free to the public. Uh, currently, they're being offered virtually in, the, in this pandemic era. Uh, and we're targeting Lakota community members as both presenters and attendees. As plants and trees focus their energy on building strength, uh, and growing from the roots during the winter, our community will join to strengthen and grow together each year, each year through sharing and learning. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our sponsors for their generous support. Uh, they include the South Dakota Humanities Council, which is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, the Bush Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities through a direct grant as well. Um, also, over the, the months of the winter, we've been asked how our supporters can contribute to our work as well. I'd suggest at least two ways in these times of virtual working and, and community care that you could do that. Uh, you can make a donation to our nonprofit partner, Magpie Creative. Um, you can donate through our Facebook page or mail, us, mail in a donation. Uh, the other thing is to support Native artists and makers and creatives directly by searching them out, buying their art, uh, buying presents for your family uh, or self-care uh, and buy directly from them. Those are really good ways to support uh, the community and the artists that we support. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, Keith's gonna talk here for the next hour and a half, two hours. We'll take a, a he's, he's presenting in sections and after each section, he'll take questions. Feel free to, um, if you're on Zoom, type your question in, or if you're on, watching on Facebook Live, you can do the same thing, and I'll make sure he sees those at the, at the appropriate time. Um, if you're on Zoom, please, we encourage you to keep your cameras on and stay fully engaged, but you know, it's, it's Saturday and uh, we've all been pinned to our screens already, so um, if you need to stay off camera, we totally understand. We want you to be comfortable and learn from Keith uh, with that in mind, I would like to um, hand it over to Keith now and introduce Keith to present his talk today. All right. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you. Opila to you, Peter, and really to Mary as well, too. I should first and foremost uh, acknowledge both of you and the work that you've done um, beyond Racing Magpie but also uh, especially at Racing Magpie because it's great work and it's really uplifting our opportunities to uh, express ourselves, but also share our identities, but really our, our spirit. Who are we as Lakota people? And especially using this vehicle of art, the synergy of art. And I think that that's amazing. So um, a lot of us owe you a, a pol or an apology, but appreciation of thanks. Um, and I, I start this first, slide with the image that you guys, if you've ever been to Racing Magpie, you've probably seen this painting hanging over there. Uh, this is one of the paintings I've done a few years back. And um, I wanted to um, kind of just focus on these creation stories. These are things that were interesting to me at the time. 
but it eventually found its purpose in going to Racing Magpie. So I feel like this is something that was meant to be and it's good to be here today. So I'm very appreciative to be here with um, you all today. So I also wanna thank all of you who are, are here uh, for your generosity and just for giving me a little bit of your time on a good Saturday to um, allow me to talk, you know, to share my story, but to also share my art. This is really what my life is. This is, is really a big part of who I am. So I'm happy to share this with you today. Um, so wherever you're from, um, I wish maybe at some point we can get more personal and actually visit more individually. But today it will be more of a, a lecture kind of format or a lot more of a presentation. So I'm gonna go through a lot of these images. I, I use them because they're supplemental and helping me share more of the story. And that way you don't have to focus on so much me as the speaker, but really kind of maybe uh, see what some of these uh, elements um, that were part of a vis visual dialogue or visual communication or visual language uh, as they can support actually what I'm saying vocally as well too, okay? So again, uh, thank you all. My, uh, the title for this presentation is Miti Takuyepi Kicha, and, and kind of talking with my, my father about this, uh, we were talking about um, what, you know, what was the purpose and what I was doing as an artist. And really it was because of my relatives and my relatives being highlighted as those who are really close to me, like the ones at home or our immediate kind of relatives that are our family. And I thought that that was definitely it. That's what I'm doing this for. But my um, whole uh, intention of doing art with the, the heart of living for my relatives, it, it has its roots. And that's what I'm gonna begin this um, presentation with is talking a little bit exactly about my roots and who my family is. So again, welcome everybody. I'll begin first by um, just acknowledging my mother and my father. My mother is actually uh, Sleta and Santa Domingo Pueblo. And my father is Oglala Lakota. And they met while they were going to school in Boulder, you know, right in the middle point of uh, the North and the South. And so I'm, I'm very thankful for, for the cultural identity that I gained from that. And um, I'm gonna focus more so on my, my father's side of my, my family, because that's really the majority of where my upbringing was, is here in uh, South Dakota area, here in the uh, Lakota homelands with my, my paternal side. And I have to start first with this image here, which is our, our namesake and um, really my great, 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 great grandfather, six generations um, before me is the first Braveheart. And uh, here's an image we have of him. And then some people, uh, my family more, more closely will, will translate his name into Chante Ohitika, which is literally Braveheart. But we have other relatives as well too that would say Chante Tiza, you know, so either I believe is uh, okay and appropriate. And we, there's, there's some we know about him, but there's also a lot we don't know about him. And what I can start to um, venture into as far as thinking, well, who is my, my ancestor is through this image. And um, it's, it's pretty uh, similar to some of the image you might come across in these historical photographs but I wanna highlight a few of his um, specific regalia or accoutrements that I think are, are really um, identifiers of who he was. And the first is his, his lance or what he's holding in his hand here. And you can notice that there's a, 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 lot, a lot of feathers, a lot of eagle feathers that are adorning that. Those are there with purpose. And those can start to kind of let us know what, who this individual might have been, especially in his relationship to the others, the community, the society. Um, those that he lived with are those that he felt were important to who he was. Another uh, really kind of specific detail that I, I found under closer examination was that there's a buffalo tail hanging at the, at the bottom of his lens. So that lets me know that maybe he was uh, somebody who actually did live for his people. He actually was a, maybe a provider to others or maybe he was part of a, a society that was involved with the hunt of the buffalo. Um, there's other, um, I guess, details in this in this imagery, but one that I think stands out the most to me and makes me very curious is his necklace, which is really upon further examination, uh, grizzly bear claws. And I know it's not something that you could probably find uh, common around um, the homelands. Maybe there's possibility of trade involved, but I feel like these kind of um, items had to be very, very much about the individual. How did they gain this? How, or how was it bestowed upon him? So that lets me know that um, you know, my, my ancestor, my, my grandfather 
he had a role that was very significant. And I feel like that's huge. That's encouraging to me. And how do I kind of lead my life now to kind of uh, give appreciation to what he did? Even if I didn't gain in his time, I'm still um, treating his spirit in that way that I, I need to um, respect and honor him with what I do. So I like to start with that image first. And that leads to the paternal um, grandfather that I have, my dad's father. His name was Alfonso Braveheart. I mean, we're from the little community of uh, Pejuta Haka. It's known as the, the town of Kyle. They just now recently changed it to Little Moon, actually, but some people may know it as Kyle. It's in the central area of the Oglala Sioux tribe. And this is where we grew up. This is kind of our home. And um, a lot of people, especially Lakota families, when you start to ask, who are you? Um, you might know kind of who someone is based off their last name. Like you can start to know where families um, are from by their last names. But you can then start to look at, well, who are your grandparents? Because we have this belief system that we are who we are because our grandparents raised us in this way, or even our parents. But really it's the grandparents that are the staples of our family, our kinship, our, our, our unit. Um, and not everybody has that. I can acknowledge that not everybody has that, but to some point, that's still part of who we are, regardless of where you might be at or where you were raised up. If you were in an urban setting, your Lakota, you still have that as part of you. You can still go back and trace, oh, who's your grandparents? And sometimes they can be uh, sisters of your actual grandmother or your brothers of your actual grandfather, but we treat them the same. We respect and acknowledge them for who they are. We understand that they've gained a um, point in life that we need to cherish them and value them and also be attentive to what they say and what they do. So we lead by that um, and how we start to develop who we are by who we see, especially those who came before us. So my grandfather is the central figure in this photograph right here. And this is a, a good way of life. This is how I can um, remember a little bit because I was still very young at, this, at these moments of time. Um, but I can remember this. I can remember a lot of my relatives and how they um, appear or kept up their appearance, how they took pride in themselves. And that came from the, the generations like I just shared with you before when they had all of their, their finest on, they still continue that. I mean, the Lakota people take a lot of pride in who they are. Um, and of course I have uncles and other grandfathers in this picture as well too. And they're all just as important as, as my grandfather would be. Okay, I wanna, I wanna move to the, um, to the maternal side, the, um, the uh, matriarchs of our society, our grandmothers, our aunties, our mothers. These are those who really keep us, um, I would say sustained and alive, that make us our, who we are as, as a nation, as our, our, our female relatives, especially our grandmothers. Uh, I like to talk about Lakota society in ancient terms when we think about this ancient identity, which is called Te Oyate, a Buffalo nation. But they is highlighted as being a female buffalo. So our ancient ancestors, their observational skills were uh, amazing, incredible, um, beyond belief sometimes because they could see within the, the buffalo as a, as a society, how that they were in balance, how did they function properly and maintain strength. It was because of the, the um, acknowledgement of the matriarch the eldest female of that nation. And it's nothing that was super specific only to the buffalo. These observations can be found elsewhere as well too. And it shows me that our, our ancestors were, were very much intellectuals. They were keen in what they were looking at, what they were listening to, and what they were open to as far as um, reception. They can gain a lot of knowledge that was very um, transcendent and that can still be, I think, explored today. And we can just go back to maybe looking at a family photo and thinking again about the strength that we see in front of us, like I see with my own grandmother. So my grandmother, my father's mother is, is here. And her name is, um, her maiden name would be Jenny Chief Bear. But she was married twice. Her first marriage, um, she took the, the last name of her husband, which was Iron Crow. And then later she married my grandfather. So she became Jenny Braveheart. And in, in her lifetime, she had 12 children. So I have a, a huge family that has a lot of little cousins and now um, great little um, cousins who are like great grandchildren. So our family's huge. But in the, my, my upbringing, this was the, the foundation. Everything revolved around her. 
all the way up until her, her death. And after her uh, departure from this world, we saw how it affected our family. And I can see that too with, with the buffalo, or even when we look into the plant relatives, when we disrupt the, the um, unshi, what happens to the nation, what happens to the, the circle. Um, so I really do a lot in my life, and I do acknowledge my grandmother the most as being um, very much the, the motivator behind what I do. Uh, here's her with some of her sisters and some of her oldest daughters. So I really enjoy this picture because it reminds me of seeing those in my lifetime. I can remember seeing when she's, I still do a little today as well too, but I also recognize how much has changed since my youth. Here's an image of her with one of her artworks. Uh, she made star quilts. And this is something that I always acknowledge and credit as being my first influence to art. I didn't think of her as an artist, and I know she never called herself an artist, but when I think back to it now, I can um, remember vividly uh, that she was continuously practicing. Every day she was working on her star quotes. And when I think about that, it makes me really um, believe that art is every day. It's not just a hobby. It's not something we do part-time or something that we do when we are in need of certain uh, hustle. It's something that you just make part of your everyday life, almost the same as prayer. So I can know that now. When I was a kid, like one of my, my little nephews here, I, I didn't really think about that. I just kind of wandered around. But I think there was this um, energy that attracted all of us, regardless of who we were, if we were an artist or if we weren't. Um, we would go into where she was working at, her studio space, and we can hear, you know, we were, our sensations were, were overwhelmed. I can now, to this day, vividly remember the sound of her sewing machine going. I can feel that pedal that she would put her foot on. I could feel that little leather strap that would rotate the, the sewing machine. I could smell certain things that were, were there in her, her workplace. Uh, so these things are, are very much important to me. And I, I continue to carry these on forward when I, when I work on the work that I create. But uh, here's an image. She didn't really document a lot of her work. I had to ask some of my relatives to help me find some imagery. But we found this photograph and I just wanted to show uh, her skill because she did not go to art school, but she definitely acquired a skill over practice and she became a master in my opinion. And a lot of her work was done with the intention of just I do this for, for purpose, to give to my relatives. So she's making these quilts for her relatives in the community or um, in other communities or her children or her grandchildren or her great-grandchildren. Uh, it was something where you, you recognized and really cherished if you got a quote from her, especially later on in life. Um, again, one of my family members shared with me this pattern that she was working on or that they had a picture of and I, I never re remember seeing these at all growing up. Um, but when I look back to them now, I can see that there was a thread of where does my creativity come from? Or what does my creativity, creativity start to um, show itself is that it's not all my doing. You know, there is no, uh, I think, any kind of intention of being original really in what I do. It has some sort of a, a thread to, to those around me and it's maybe inherited as well too. So here's one of my, my grandmother's, um, and I, I, I like the ideas here because it's something different. It shows she was exploring different concepts of design and color scheme, and not just only a very kind of limited approach to a standard star quilt. Uh, there's some sort of composition taking place as well too. On the right side is a pattern that my father drew, and he works on beadwork. <clears throat> he works really in the style which is called Ojibwe or, or, or brick style. And um, I know he's picked this up over time. He, was, he, he gained an introduction to it. But again, my father never really called himself an artist either. He, this was something that he just, I think, had a, a love for doing, a genuine love for doing. But he made things, especially for his relatives, for his, his children. But it shows that maybe he was also carrying some sort of a gene or some sort of an inspiration from his mother as well, too. I'm sure he was well aware of what his mother was doing. So that inspired him as well, too. And, um, and like I said, he made little um, works of art for those he loved. He made me a little belt buckle when I was a little guy. I know it was probably for the purpose of um, taking a little picture. 
um, but I kept it and this is kind of the state it's in now. <laughs> but um, I, I do cherish this because again, growing up, I never thought of my, my father as really that inspiration because I didn't see him painting with acrylic paint or I didn't see him doing any of these fine art media. So maybe I, I overlooked that, that he was an artist, but I, to me, it was just my father, you know, first and foremost was, was the relationship. Um, and just kind of a, a preview of, of what's yet to come. Um, thanks to the, the path I took in life, me and my dad now are gonna have an art show next year, which is gonna be here in the state of South Dakota. And we're gonna be able to, to share our works and to have a conversation and maybe even involve my grandmother as well too. And, and that's something that, you know, maybe would have never been possible if not, I, I went on the path that I'm gonna share with you guys as, as far as how I got to where I'm at today as being an artist. But this will be on exhibit and I'm gonna look at it and reinterpret it as, as some sort of a fine art piece. Um, I just wanna talk about at this moment right now, a little bit of like, uh, critically, what could we think about as what defines art? When we say, what is Lakota art, what could that be? And this is for those who may be from um, our Lakota homelands or our Lakota families, but really any person can consider this as well too. Um, what can art be? Could it be the action of preparing papa like we see in this image here? Could it be the um, process of going and finding those posts to create that shade right behind? Um, I, I think so. And I think there's so much other ways that we can start to begin to discuss, well, what can art really be if we wanna allow it to be Lakota? Um, but it can also be an acrylic painting. It can be inspired by different historical uh, Eurocentric art movements as well too. I think that we can start to combine a lot of what we need to, which pertains to where we're at today. And maybe we also do emphasize that today means uh, yesterday. It also means tomorrow as well too. So really involving more kind of um, profound concepts of you know, how we're related to, to time as well. There are uh, specific examples of what we can call Lakota art and, and different indigenous art forms to the Northern Plains. And, and these are, are widely known, um, but I would like to take a little time for those who might be coming into this presentation with no prior knowledge to, to what Lakota art might be to share some examples. And, and just like a lot of indigenous cultures and a lot of cultures across the world really, uh, it's just a basic expression, an urgency to be expressive. How do you do that? You'll make a mark or you'll leave your mark. Um, some that are specific to our area are petroglyphs, and these are individual based. There are certain um, visions and dreams and communications that will come to an individual and they want to document that or maybe create a dialogue with who's going to come after them to that spot. So there's a lot of uh, iconography, a lot of design, a lot of drawing uh, involved in this but it could also just be your handprint as well too. I think the, the one that will probably get the highlighted the most when we think about, well, what is Lakota art will probably be uh, quill work or beadwork. A lot of the regalia making, a lot of the adornment, uh, what they call artifact, but what we can call art. And I would really emphasize art because there's so much thought that went into this and really elevated thought where it's not just randomly Let's just stitch some quills onto this hide and put it on our feet. Let's actually have purpose behind it. Let's actually have some sort of a intention for where this work is going, but also what is it saying? You know, it's my voice, I'm the maker of this, I'm saying something with it, but also it's a collective voice. I'm also helping to interpret this person's um, thoughts or concerns or understandings, or maybe it's all of us. Maybe this is my family's story here involved in these geometrics and these color designs and schemes. So um, again, our artists really make things because first and foremost, they have a, a compassion behind their motivation. They're making these with um, love. They want these to go to somebody for sometimes very, very severe purposes, protection maybe, or maybe just because you wanna see this person make it to another dimension, a spirit world possibly. These are important items. They're no longer just a a wall hanging or a piece to sit on a pedestal. But like with all art, we're introduced to new expressions and to, 
new moments and that comes with materials you know it, i mean we can talk again critically about the whole transitional periods of time from the buffalo days to the reservation period and we can go on and on about what the the harms were and the ramifications but we can also look through art as vehicle at what are things that came with that a renaissance in a way with um ledger drawing you know how prolific is ledger drawing today even contemporary still today what are the versions what's the aesthetic of look uh, ledger art what are the politics behind ledger art when you talk about that today you know who has the right to do ledger art all of these kind of discussions are really interest me but i also know where it comes from you know and i i really love that from this negative moment of of, of having your life change especially for a a, a male um, relative instead of dwelling on that you channel that energy that creativity that expression and you create a whole new you know moment for for us all um, so there's a lot of examples of ledger art i won't go on and on about it i know that a lot of people are probably familiar with it but i do share this image of one of our, our great grandfathers sitting bull who's from our hunkpapa relatives up north and that i always say look at he signed it he um said i'm taking ownership that this is my drawing this isn't Gaul's drawing or touch the clouds drawing. This is my drawing. Um, and he was claiming this, this authority. I'm an artist. And I think he probably had that thought in his mind, especially when he got a little bit more celebrity as he was traveling the world. And he was probably selling these as well too. And then today, I mean, what is this worth today? Priceless, right? Um, okay. So that's a little bit of the history. That's a little bit of my education um, background coming up. Now I'm gonna move into talking about me, yeah, me. <laughs> um, I didn't start out like Sitting Bull. I wasn't drawing those really awesome courting scenes when I was in my youth. Um, I was drawing popular interests, in, which was derived from popular culture. I liked basketball. My first drawings, um, I mean, I didn't really draw anything native themed. Um, it was really more so of just what was my interest as a youth. Um, and basketball. I mean, basketball is still very big on our homelands today. It probably will always be. Um, but that was my, one of my first drawings. And I like to always point out that I was similar to Sitting Bull and that, yeah, look at, I signed it. Keith B.H. He was taking ownership of his drawing. He even signed it twice. He must have really been proud of it. <laughs> um, but my drawing skills, they, they develop over time. I, I like to share this with my students and explaining that we all have a starting point someplace. You know, we might just be inspired because we like something. Um, but maybe we also have a, a goal in our mind, like I really want to draw people, I want it to look like them, and we keep working at that, even though there's no grade attached, or there's no course learning um, involved in it or nothing like that. But of course, I had moments where I had to problem solve, right? I couldn't draw Anthony Hardaway's facial features, so my um, solution was to blacken it all out, you know, and I was also learning the the importance of should I mix media? Should I go in with pen and pencil or is too much too much, you know, but these are just those first moments when we begin. Um, I primarily went to school here in Kyle at Little Wound um, and I and I loved it. I mean, I, I enjoyed it because this is my home and I, I, I had a lot of great friends and um, it wasn't as difficult as high school can be maybe made out to be. Um, one of the things that really did get me by was enjoying just my time to make art. Like a lot of other schools, we have art courses, but they're not super course um, specific or, or curriculum specific. We don't probably have an intensive um, lesson plan. It might just be that we have a room now with some pencils in it that we can do some drawing. So I'll take advantage of that. But a lot of my drawing actually took place outside of the classroom at home. Sometimes when I wanted to stay in and maybe not, uh, um, try to take the invitation by my cousins to go out and who knows what I'll get myself into, but stay home and listen to music. And in that moment, just kind of start to create these drawings that I wanted to create. Um, they were fun for me, but then I also saw they had an impact on my friends, you know, cousins, people at school, they enjoyed them as well too. And they would um, ask me to make a drawing for them of their, their heroes or their um, inspirations like Jennifer Lopez or Tupac Shakur. <laughs> So over time, my, my practice got a little bit stronger. My technique got a little stronger just because of that practice. It wasn't something that 
um, I would say I was born with or something that, um, you know, was a secret to it or nothing. It's just, if you wanna get good at a skill, keep practicing it. The, the biggest life-changing moment in, in my artistic career came as I graduated high school. Um, I was happy to graduate high school. That was a big goal in itself for me. Um, I didn't have no um, idea of what to do next following that. Um, and I was very fortunate to, to be in, invited to attend uh, an art camp in the summer, that period right when I graduated into the, the fall semester. But it's a two week program at the uh, University of South Dakota and it's called the Oscar House Summer Art Institute. Some people may be familiar with this. It gets its namesake from our great uh, Dakota artist here in South Dakota, Oscar Howe. Very, very legendary artist and, and has a lot of purpose in what he helped create as a legacy. And his institute is definitely part of that. And I wasn't aware of it um, until I had actually graduated high school, but it had been in existence before then. And I didn't know what to expect when I was going over there and I almost didn't go. I almost talked myself out of it because I was just like, I don't know what this is, but I'm very glad that I had sor um, sources of support around me that, that um, encouraged me to go and, and see for myself what it is. When I did get there, um, that was my first true introduction to, to Native art in the sense of it being actually something, but also existing within modern and contemporary. Um, I understood that there was star quilts, there was beadwork, um, maybe that people did drawings and stuff like that. But that was really the extent of my knowledge of art. And when I got there, like I said, it was a life changing moment because the first day I, I learned who Oscar Hell was. Not only did I learn who he was, I went in to see his actual work. And this is one of the first pieces I saw, which was his abstract work. And I could just remember thinking like, what is this? You know, this is totally uh, alien. <laughs> I'm not used to seeing this but um, it had some sort of unspoken connection with me. It, I, I could see it in a different um, way than maybe other people might see it. To me, it had life to it. I could see it breathing. And I felt like there was something there that just, I think, possessed me for those two weeks to stay focused and to just get the most I could and to really cherish what that moment was in front of me, that um, gift of what this institute was. So um, at the institute, I also had really great um, instructors, art instructors who were out there making a career as artists. And I've got to really give a lot of thanks to um, Gerald Knoyer, who was um, running this art institute and how he also encouraged me to look at, well, what could I do? I could maybe apply to an art um, program somewhere. And he also let me know that there was a school specifically for native arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that, that's where he went to school. So I applied and I got into the Institute of American Indian Arts. And I went right away, right after I went to the Oscar Howe Institute, I, got, I made my travel back to New Mexico because my, my mother's from down there and I had um, moments from my, my childhood where we lived down there as well too. So I, I knew New Mexico had family down there, but I also didn't really know Santa Fe that well. Um, so going there was a whole new experience as well too. And um, again, I didn't know anything really about IAIA um, other than it was an art college, um, little did I would I find out that it's it has its own uh, incredible legacy as well too, and so many native artists have gone through there, and and that's that I was a part of something I was a part of something that was developing that I had no idea of at the moment. I just felt like oh, okay, I'm happy to just kind of go try something new. Um, <clears throat> so I spent my my time. You may notice that some of these. <laughs> Uh, dates seem very long, like um, it doesn't take 15 years to get a degree. <laughs> um, this is um, actually a, a typo on my half, it should say 2006. Uh, the, I think I might have copied and pasted from my previous image, but here just indicates that um, I, I was invited back a second year to kind of help and I kind of raised up in, in ranks and, uh, as to speak, as to become a, a student helper, mentor, I was unpaid, it was just a, like a really great internship, um, but eventually I would become an actual faculty and, and eventually a, a coordinator and assistant director of it as well too. So I spent many summers at the Oscar Howe Summer Art Institute. Um, and here I actually spent five years at IAIA. Um, because I took a little bit extra time to, to try to enjoy my, my time down there and take classes that weren't 
necessarily necessarily requirements, but I wanted to take them. And when I got to IAI, I knew I loved to draw, but I also um, didn't know exactly what I wanted to focus on. So I chose photography. So I'm sharing with you some of the images of my photography work that really was my, my area of focus for, for my undergraduate time. I loved the whole traditional photography medium. It was so fun to just roll my own film, go out and shoot film, um, learn how to create the developer and the fix and all that kind of stuff, work in the dark room. Um, those, are, those are great memories. And I also got into printmaking as well too, just because I think of the process and the, the materials and the meticulous nature of, of those media, it was um, really fun to me. I didn't really get into painting so much while I was down there um, to start with. Um, I thought that these other things were cool because I had never really done them before. Uh, so some of my, my photos are, are just finding those moments of what I was again observing around me, maybe thinking about where my place was, what time is it, what are things that other people might just uh, look beyond our past, but things that I felt were special to me, things that were significant to me, like a, a, a little sign on the side of the road between Porcupine and Wounded Knee. A lot of people might just pass by it, but for me, I thought about what does that represent about uh, historically? What happened there? What's unseen? You know, where are the, our relatives who might be moving across that landscape still? Things like that were, were, were my mind was as a, as a young person. At IAIA, um, again, like I said, I was introduced to a new legacy. And with that brought so many different um, doors that opened up when I, when I seen Fritz Shoulders work, when I saw TC Cannon's work. Um, I was very lucky to work within kind of the museum down there in Santa Fe. So while I was walking around in between classes and things like that, I'd see these massive paintings that were part of their, their collection, but also in Santa Fe, there's so much art around you that after a while you, you kind of, I think, get, you buy into it and you'd be like, I wanna do that too. And I think that's one of the greatest, um, I think words of advice that I, I hear from a lot of painters is like, to be a painter, to really motivate yourself to paint, you gotta look at painting. You gotta see what other painters are doing because that's gonna force you to do something of your own. So seeing these type of paintings in person and not in a book, man, that motivated me or started to um, motivate me more and more to wanna paint. And not just only there in Santa Fe, I, I need to also mention that again, when I come back to Oscar House Summer Art Institute every summer, it was just great because I get more and more knowledge. I learn more and more through actual artworks that are in front of me. I get to see pieces by Arthur Amiot and Bobby Penn, who are some of the students of Oscar Howe's first um, uh, generation of students. There's also others that are worth mentioning, like Donald Montalo and um, others as well, too, like Herman Red Elk. There's many, many students that, that are, that are um, just as equally important, but I'm just trying to share a few examples for those who might be coming familiar with a little bit of our um, more modern contemporary art history. Um, <clears throat> but of course, when you're in art school, you also learn world art history. And when I encountered the Fauvists, if you're not familiar, a French um, group of painters from the um, early 1900s, they changed my world again in that they really showed me that it can be so freeing, so fun, the medium of paint. There's something different there that I can achieve that I can't get with working with my camera or working with a print um, um, process. And when I seen how they created these really, I think, stoic, romantic manifestos and theories about what color represented, you know, and how we should disregard even worrying about um, mixing a certain color, but go arbitrary and just poo color. There's no time to think about it, just put it down. Those made me paint nonstop. Um, and I wasn't doing this for class so much, I was doing it for myself. And I brought in my, my interest for, for drawing and kind of my skills that I could use as a crutch to help me begin. But it was a whole new um, bag of tools, a whole new um, luggage to open up and find what's inside that um, painting was was totally something new and it took a while it took a while to really understand and under, um, practice everything um, proficiently um, and again it would have helped more so if I would have just took a class and learned that way but um, I wasn't yet ready for that 
but I had such good friends who were also painters. And a lot of the times I would sit in the paint studio just visiting with them, watching them paint, talking through ideas. So I got to give a lot of thanks to my friends. And one that I would like to highlight is Denton Lafferty. Uh, he was also a student at IAI. He was a painting um, major and he just gave me so much of what he shared. And because we were collas, we were good friends. We came from the same community. His family's from here in the Kyle area as well too. So he actually um, had a stretch canvas before, because before this I was painting mainly just on paper, but he had a stretch canvas that was really nice. And he actually said, here, take that, you know, and he kind of gave me an encouragement. He said, paint on it. And it was pretty big, it was a big size canvas. So um, it was really one of the first canvases I painted on. And I didn't know exactly what to do, but I spent a good amount of time just working on this piece. And I can remember that I entered this into our student art show down there in Santa Fe and how it was just a, one of those moments where you start to really see what are you capable of? Because I can remember it getting accepted into the show, but I can also remember showing up to the reception, the opening night and seeing that there were people there waiting to buy it. And, and that was one of the first um, moments where I actually sold art and I, I didn't get into art to, to make a living off of it or, or anything like that. But to have that occur definitely pushed me to know that, okay, you should feel more confident in what you're doing or what you're kind of where you're traveling because you're probably on the path that you need to be on um, in a way. But I guess money does also come in handy, especially when you're in college and you're, you're really, um, I guess, looking at the dollar menu, like it's um, really, really high eating. <laughs> but I, I got my degree over time um, and a lot of my work started to get more and more, um, I would say, stronger in, in that it was just um, accepting that it's paint. It's accepting that it's okay to do what you're doing. Don't feel like you have to mimic so-and-so. You don't have to make a certain style of art for it to be acceptable. Just do what pleases you first and allow yourself to continue to grow. Don't feel like you know everything right now. Don't feel like you're um, super painter or nothing like that. Just know that you're just, you know, getting your, your, your feet underneath you. Um, but a lot of the other influence came from the professional side as well too. Like I said, exhibiting my work. And I can remember the first time I shared my work with the Red Cloud Art Show here in Pine Ridge area. Um, this was my first entry, one of the three that I first entered. And I never knew about the art show until I had actually met um, Mary Bordeaux as a student at IAIA. And she was um, passing out entry forms for the show. And that really made me push to say, okay, I, if it's there in South Dakota, right in, on Pine Ridge, I'll enter it. So I did, and I entered this piece. And I remember going to the show for the very first time and seeing that it had third place. That's when they gave first, second, and third. And I got third place and I was just like super happy. I was. Just, unbelievable. I didn't expect to win anything. But then also what was really um, heartfelt too was I saw who won first and second place. I began to familiarize myself with these artists and then to see my work alongside them. Like I can remember seeing Jim Yellowhawk's work for the first time, Dwayne Wilcox's work for the first time. You know, I can see Richard Reddall and Roger Brower, all these names of artists who were um, doing this for a lot longer than I had been. And um, to see that I was kind of gaining some sort of entry that was really um, just, it's um, hard to say, <laughs> but um, it meant so much. And, and I viewed these um, artists like they're heroes and, and I, I always wanted to approach them in a way, but I was still kind of um, figuring out exactly how to do that. Um, I didn't know exactly the whole function of, of the, the art spheres yet. So I began to learn that. Um, at IAIA, we had our, our, um, our graduating show and what I did was I really began to just mix my work. I, I kind of had elements of my ph photography and I start to bring that into my painting, but I, I recognized also that my painting was taking more of the, the dominance away. My paintings were really, really starting to become more of what my, my art was about. So I, I accepted that. And as I left IAIA, I, I, I really make the claim that I was a painter. Um, <clears throat> I returned home to South Dakota and I actually moved to Rapid City and I didn't have the most amazing job out of um, undergraduate school. I just did what I could to, to, to continue to survive, but I never lost my inspiration to make work. I actually made myself more dedicated to do work regardless of what I could. And I was younger, so of course you can pull all nighters and you can really work yourself into the, to the night. 
you know, sometimes I might have to paint at a kitchen table or, or what be. Um, but this painting here, I feel is, is really significant as a moment that um, made me realize that I can kind of start to truly get myself out there and be an artist. I can be my identity. Um, I, I was working on this at the moment when my grandmother was, had become ill and she was in the hospital. I remember seeing her for, for the last time and ultimately she um, passed away. Before the last, very last time I saw her, um, she was, she looked very healthy. I, I was at the hospital um, and you know how grandmothers are, they do care about everybody. They, they very much, uh, um, I don't know if we should say enable, but they really care about all of their grandchildren and their children. But she gave me some, a couple dollars. And I think her, her thinking was go get something to eat or something like that. Um, and I didn't um, refuse her money. I took it, but I didn't get nothing to eat with it either. I kept it because um, that was the last time I saw her, I think a day or, or so afterwards she passed away. So I was dealing with that transition. Like I said, when that, when that matriarch leaves, what happens to the rest of you, right? Um, I was also working on this painting, which I didn't know exactly what I was gonna do with it. I thought I could maybe make something and I saw a call for entry for the South Dakota governor's biennial. And I was like, I'm gonna try that out just to see if I can get in there and see what it's about really. Cause that would have been really the first time I tried something non native as far as a, a venue or a platform. And during that time when I was thinking about all of like what it meant to see my grandmother pass on and these ideas of like um, death and life and, and all that, it, it came through in my work and even having some of the sprinkles of my inspiration of like looking at Oscar Howe and all these other painters that were really good foundations for me as well too. But I actually took one of those last dollars and I put it in there. So that's why the, the title references Uchi, Unchi's last dollar. Um, and it was great because it got into the show um, it was accepted in, and I can remember its its first opening, I think was at the Dahl Art Center in Rapid City. And I, I had gotten an honorable mention. And again, those are those um, moments that you don't expect. Like I didn't think this was gonna win an award, um, yet alone be purchased by the Dahl for their collection. Um, but when that happened, that was great. And I'm very thankful for that. But what meant, the, what meant more to me um, was that somebody from one of the local tribal newspapers, they, they did a feature on on that honorable mention award. And they, they ran it on the front page of their paper. Um, so I had a picture of myself and then the painting and I think they had a few questions that they had asked me. But when I return home, when I come back to Kyle or when I go visit other relatives just out there in, in our homelands, they'd always talk about that. They said, hey, I saw you on the paper. Or I remember even going to like um, my auntie's home and she had the little clipping hanging up on her wall. You know, my cousin, even though he's not all about art or nothing like that, he had the clipping uh, tucked into his mirror. So uh, seeing that was uh, very, very moving. Uh, after that, I gained life experience. And uh, this is another moment that I think really um, deserves to be discussed real quickly is um, I moved to Rosebud to the Sichangu Lakota Oyate. And that's where my wife is from. I met my wife and, and really having that moment where she shared with me her, her homeland um, introduced me to so many good foundations that helped me to do the work that I'm doing right now today. And um, I got to also remember a lot of these um, great relatives who are no longer with us, like Albert Whitehat and Francis Cutt, but there's a lot of other relatives out there too, like Sam Hindcrane, um, and all of their, their work that they did with helping pass on knowledge, um, because now they're, they're not here anymore. But <clears throat> while we were there, we worked with the program that was all about uh, equine therapy or Lakota-based equine assisted therapy. And that really began to open up a new route of where I would go that I never expected, which would be community involved or community engaged type of work. Um, but through my wife and why I have to praise her so high is she was also a big um, um, voice of support. And she said, you should go back to school. And in my connections with USD, I was offered the opportunity to go to um, graduate school there and I, I took it and I returned to um, USD to, to pursue my master's degree. And, and I, I focused on that for, for three years. And I'm very thankful for that three years as well too, because it really helped me get stronger again in my work and to find exactly what I wanna do with my work. So I just recently graduated a few years ago. Um, and this is a, a image of my, my, my thesis work. I'll talk a little bit more about it after the break but it was a, a, a body of work and it was talking about 
our um, Lakota creation stories, but also thinking about how we can start to move those forward today and not only feel like they exist only in the past so much. How do we make new approaches to, to transferring these cultural continuums? <clears throat> and finally, <clears throat> where I'm at after graduation, I returned home. I'm back in Kyle now. Um, and I'm happy to be back in Kyle because again, I get to make time for my family. I get to visit not in the past year so much, but um, it's good because I also was offered the opportunity to, to take the position of art instructor at OLC, the Oglala Lakota College. And I'm happy to be able to share whatever I can and to bring whatever privileges I've gained in my life and my, my little um, journey and pass them on to, to those who, who might be able to use them, especially coming from similar backgrounds like I did as well too. But then also to try to help uplift that we have many artists, we have a, a really um, Lakota arts excellence that exists and how can we start to push that further out there so more and more people can be aware of it as well too. And I mean, I still hold on to these thoughts that I acknowledge that it all comes from someplace. There's all something there that's beyond me and just my decision to go and be an artist and they lie in, in these um, roots of the feminine, you know, my, my grandmothers, um, but also my grandfathers, you know, all of those that were before me um, for generations and generations, they have really helped me to, to understand these things today. So that's kind of the first section of this presentation. I believe we can take a break. I need to drink some water. Um, if people have questions, feel free to, maybe we can take a moment to ask questions. Um, but other than that, I think we're going to take a little intermission, right, Peter? Yeah, why don't we um, take like the next few minutes to, if anyone has questions, to type them in or um, raise your hand and I'll uh, turn on your mic and then right on the hour we'll, we'll take that few minute break and just a couple minutes and then get back to Keith's presentation. So yeah, type in your questions, raise your hand. Um, while you do that, I have a, um, someone left a comment on Facebook that I wanted to read. Angie Stover just said, no questions, just an agreement that we as Lakota live art. What we create, we do it with the people in mind who will enjoy or appreciate it. Yes, a lot of elevated thoughts goes into everything. I consider my meals an art, attractive, useful, tasty, sensual, and filled with love and prayers. Quilting, beading, sewing clothes, leather work, creating a family, etc. Does anyone have questions at this stage? We don't have to drag it out too long. Just um, there's one in the in the chat. Keith, do you see it, or do you want me to read it? Um, it's from Kea uh, Trujillo Claremont says, what advice would you give any youth that is trying to navigate this education system? Um, yeah, that's a reality. Education systems are, are they're, they're little paths in their own selves as far as like exactly how are you moving through that I guess for me it was artistically so I have to go through this European art history Western societies art history but then I also have to remember exactly what is our Lakota um, art history I got to gain more and more I don't know everything but I'm, I'm always out there continuously seeking how I can try to better equip myself so trying to listen to as many people as I can even if they're people that I might not normally want to listen to like I can remember encountering um, rooms where I'm the only native in there at all and of course, everybody's going to have some sort of um, perception of who you are just based off of your identity, especially if you're like in South Dakota, for example, you know, they might say, oh, you're from the res and or automatically they, they think of what your, um, I guess, levels of um, <clears throat> um, proficiency might be. So I think you, you have to find um, supports. And again, maybe it's not as hard as it, it needs to be. I'm just maybe thinking about it too much, but Maybe it's just finding your relatives, you know, finding those who are going to help you, you know, centering yourself. And I think that's why for people who are Indigenous or Lakota, it's really important to fully understand what does that mean and what does that entail? Like, 
um, not to overlook your culture, um, cultural structures. You know, we, we might think that there's a certain way where it becomes um, very stoic or even the word traditional might be kind of hard for some people, but there's a lot of things there that are very important. And I think um, all of our relatives who live within that um, practice and that con consistency of lifestyle, they know that and they're still um, um, there as well too to help kind of guide us along. So really, I think some people feel like they have to escape the res. They have to get away from our, our, our relatives, you know, from home uh, to, be, to make it, to become great. When really you're great already, you're born into that. And you have all of these, um, um, I guess, tools and power sources around you. It's just, how do you start to recognize those? Maybe now moving forward as, um, as different kind of um, leaders and, and developing leaders, we can think about, well, what can we do to, to help kind of facilitate those or make them more accessible to those who might not um, have that um, in their own family. And I know that those are, um, movements that are taking place right now. There's a lot of um, grassroots led initiatives that are bringing back language, but also the significance of, of Ohunkanka, our creation stories, but maybe even helping uh, those who feel very timid and scared to even uh, go to a ceremony to maybe feel like, oh, okay, I, I can go. I, um, I, I don't have to feel scared to. Um, or maybe finding a respectful approach for how to address a, a relative, how to say lekshi, our tui, our, our kaka, and chi, and ask that you need help, you know, because we got to kind of, I think, recognize sometimes too that we need help. So something like that, like navigating these um, educational systems, it might sound very hard when you're taking that on yourself, like saying, oh, I got to do this, but really think about your relatives, maybe they can help you. Uh, well, there's a question there from Jared too. It says, without sharing too much of your own family history, did you find out what the significance of your grandfather's bear claw necklace was? And he thanks you for your knowledge and the work you do. I can I can have some estimations of what, what that maybe um, signified. And I'm sure if I really got more invested into the research and really, really went out there, I could probably find what it meant. But I'm sure he was part of a, a kola kiche, a, a society. Uh, I'm pretty sure he had um, individual deeds that he accomplished in his lifetime. There are some um, recorded uh, histories that are out there a little bit on, on, on him, but sometimes I, I don't really take them in uh, too, too, too much because I don't know, um, as, a, as a scholar, as an academic myself, it's like when I, when I get different accounts of, of what people have said about our history, I got to look at it very closely and try to see if there's any inconsistencies or, or start to try to find where um, I can make the, the most sense out of it. And I, and I really don't personally like to rely on that kind of route because I feel like, um, again, if it's Lakota, it should be Lakota based. So I would have to go to my, um, my relatives and maybe uh, those who, who hold on to those, those um, stories more so. And I'm pretty sure we could probably get that, but I mean, I just think that's uh, very, very powerful, right? To have a, a grizzly claw bear necklace. Um, and I know there's certain um, representations of what the, that means in our culture, but I think that it's just, again, one of the, uh, a masculine type of attribute. Thanks, Keith. There's a question on, uh, Zoom and on Facebook that both kind of ask about resources um, to to teach Lakota art or native art. Um, Barb here on Zoom is asking about visual arts for um, students who are deaf or, or have uh, hearing disabilities. And there's another person on Facebook, Lisa, asking about resources for teaching native art, historical and contemporary for high school art teachers in South Dakota. So maybe you can answer this one and we'll then we'll take a couple minute break. Um, yeah, there, there needs to be resources. Um, and I'm sure there's there's certain things out there. But again, these are probably things that need to, to, to happen from within. So it'd be great to see more of a collective effort to help um, really put that out there. And I know we're in discussions of concepts for like a Lakota Arts Council that would be a community type of art council. And maybe that can help bring together more um, authentic curriculum and, and examples or resources to share out there in the larger um, world. 
But I think that there's also, again, so many different variations of what Lakota art is that you can't have one authority on that. I can't speak for, for everything because I definitely don't know everything. Um, but I can start to help try to bring that together where maybe we can um, bring everybody who might know something here, something there together. And maybe we can really um, make that become something that is, is utilized throughout, you know, becomes a standard, hopefully. That would be great, I think. But um, yeah, it, it's hard because even within our, our tribal <clears throat> um, communities, we still got to do some education as well, too, as to how do we start to um, let our relatives understand that there is contemporary art, you know, and why should there be contemporary Lakota art? But then we also need to let contemporary artists know that they have a strong voice in what they're doing out there in the world too, um, that represents for all of us. And they need to be knowledgeable as well too about the context and what I guess the, the seriousness is about certain parts of what art represents culturally as well too. So um, it goes back and forth. And I think that we haven't quite yet got there, but I think hopefully soon we will be. Thank you. Um, and thank you guys all for, for hanging out and for being here. I do appreciate that. And I mean, it's Saturday. You guys could all be at rummage sale or watching whatever's on TV. So I do appreciate you guys being here for sure. Um, and I have a few more things that we'll talk about in the second section and we'll, we'll wrap up. I don't know, Peter, do you want to take a intermission, intermission or should we just continue? It's, it's up to you, Keith. Do you need, are you good to go on or do you want to take a couple minutes? <clears throat> I'm good. I just needed some water because my <laughs> throat dries up from talking. Um, okay. Then, yeah, yeah, we can just we keep on checking. There's, can I add one more question, one more uh, comment from Facebook just to give you another yeah. breath? Um, Angie sure. Stover just chimed in again and said, my big frustration was that no one believes that something's a Lakota piece of art unless it fits their Eurocentric idea of what art is. We as Lakota have our own unique sense of what art is. Wanted to be recognized as an artist or anything really in both worlds requires the initials behind our name acquired from our education. In our culture, if you have, if you have proven yourself as qualified in your chosen area, people will see it and honor it. Mm -hmm. I can agree with that. Um, it, it, it comes down to, I think you just think about really what makes you happy, you know, if, if you're gonna attempt to make art and use that title of artist with A-R-T-I-S-T, -I, I mean, that's not a Lakota word, so you're probably gonna have to make that fit within that world or you make your Lakota somewhat follow into that world. But if you recognize first and foremost that you're just Lakota and that the other world has to fit what you're doing, you know, it comes secondary, then I think you'll feel even more empowered to to just continue to put your work out there regardless, you might actually um, find that confidence in your voice become stronger and stronger as you go forward. And other people will recognize that as well too. And I think they'll start to appreciate that more because when it comes down to it in whatever art world, whether it's Western society or mass culture or Lakota or indigenous, I think people just wanna be, feel like there's something honest in front of them. You know, when you encounter a communication or some sort of a dialogue, you want to feel like there's some sort of honesty involved in it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I continuously work to try to, to push all of these type of barriers as well, too. Um, and to try to have people just maybe not even feel like there's a goal. There's not no answer to all of it. Maybe it's just that we um, think about it. You know, what does the thinking lead to? Maybe the thinking leads to action. I don't know. But at least the thought is, is something as well, too. So thank you, thank you, Angie, and uh, thank you for being here. And I also seen your work before, Angie, so I really do appreciate it as well too. And I don't know who all we have here either. Uh, I see John, uh, um, John, hello, John. It's, it's good to have you here as well too. I really respect John as well too. Um, all right, we'll continue on. So I'm um, sorry, I can't see everybody. I'm trying to move through this quickly so everybody can go about the rest of their day as well too. <clears throat> So the second section is going to talk about a few topics that I really focus on with my art. This is what I, I make art about, and this is really why I do it is for these purposes and for these um, reasons. But the first I'm going to start with is contemporary and empowered voice. And really what I was thinking about was it's like, what is contemporary Lakota art? Um, I, I seen the, the, the lance, the necklace, the, the pipe bag that my um, 
my grandfather, the first brave heart was wear, um, holding and wearing. Um, and I, I probably could mimic those if I, if I was a traditional artist, but my work isn't about that. I, um, I don't make star quotes like my, my own she did. Um, I might make something for my family, but a lot of the times they're, they're more about paintings. They're more of things that would be non-practical for Lakota people. We don't have really a use for a painting or a sculpture or anything like that. So my work is, is really not, you know, that essential to um, who we are as Lakota people. Um, I don't serve a purpose um, within our, our customary practices as an artist, but I make art with the intention that it's having some sort of a purpose for being Lakota. I do this because I need to do something more than just only sell it. You know, I'm not trying to, um, you know, capitalize off of my culture or my identity or my, my family or nothing like that. So um, I'm trying to think about, well, it has to have a, a different impact of what it's gonna do if it's gonna be out there in the world. So that's kind of where this contemporary um, intention comes from. It's really about empowering. I'm hoping to lift up um, the awareness that we can do things that normally we might not think we're capable of doing or we might feel like we're withheld from, we're not supposed to be doing or because of whatever reasons, like there's a whole lot of different um, purposes for how our mentality has been shaped to, to think the way it thinks today. And now we see different uh, avenues that some of our, our relatives are taking to help change that. It's okay to speak Lakota and it's not only okay, it's okay to, to get you know, better at it and to share it with your children. You know, so we've seen a lot of things change because that's not the way it always was, right? There were a lot of my, my relatives who are here now can probably talk about when, you know, it was probably hard to speak Lakota. You can get punished or made fun of, you know, all these type of different things. But how do we start to empower ourselves again? How do we empower that voice? So <clears throat> I have just a few images. I, I have a lot of work out there. Um, not all of it is great. Um, I never will say it's, it's great. But um, I'm sharing just a few images just to kind of give people an idea of what I'm working on and what I have worked on. Um, and in this piece right here, I mean, contemporary to me just simply means like it's artwork being done by an artist today and it's about today. And I think that it's always been that, you know, even our relatives who were, who were back in the, the Buffalo days, they were making art about their world then as well too. So we can definitely say it could be considered contemporary, you know? I mean, as far as just what the idea of it is, um, when we think about it and we try to fit it into a, a Western society art history, then of course you have to be, you know, mindful of how that actually fits in. But um, I think that it's just always been a part of who we are. Um, I really applaud a lot of our, our relatives because they're so creative um, when it comes to just when you get something and you do something different with it, you know, and you can pick up a, a, a something that people would throw away or consider trash and you can reconfigure it. You can make it high art. You can change the whole <clears throat> perception of what it actually is. Um, even with um, items that might not be a part of your world, you know, something new gets introduced like ledger paper or beads, you know, and that becomes a big part of our identity today. You know, that's really what you know, is the first thought of when people think of what is Lakota art, they'll look at that probably first too. So maybe into the future, who knows, maybe when people look at a painting, they can just think, oh, that's Lakota art, um, and it won't really challenge them so much. I think about what's happening around me constantly. I mean, we all do, and I feel like that's what I enjoy making art about is uh, what the world is like through my eyes. Um, and it's not always about like, convincing people to, to, to think the same way that I think. It's just to share with them what my perspective is. And usually sometimes it is very informed by others as well too. It's not just only my perspective. And um, sometimes I think like the, the best thing that I can do as an artist is to try to magnify voice, make something more heard or, or visible um, when it's not. And, and this piece, I mean, a lot of people can see it and probably think of what it represents and means to them. And that's what I want. I don't want people to have to ask me so much about what does it mean to me? I mean, we could probably put it together and we're probably all gonna be on the same page very, very much. Um, and that shows the power of, of visual communication. Visual arts is like 
We don't have to say nothing. I don't have to tell you what this piece is. You'll probably understand it anyways. You'll probably add your thoughts to it and even make it even better than, than just what my thoughts would be. You know, if we all did that together, what further could we get to, right? Um, so I won't go into too much detail talking about this piece. And sometimes titles help as well too. Uh, text is always a good um, lead way in that helps us kind of think a little bit more about what it could represent as well too. Um, I actually just finished this piece over the, the winter um, break between uh, semesters. And it was intended to go to the South Dakota governor's biannual. So um, ever since that first time I entered and I shared with that picture of my um, my Unchi, Unchi's last dollar, I've gotten invites to um, be a part of the show again and again. Um, <clears throat> and I always like to try to think, well, hopefully I'm not just being asked because I'm a native and you guys want something native looking. And if I do enter something in, then I'm gonna try to maybe think of it differently a little bit, not make it too easy to find out that it's native. I mean, using the Lakota word here is pretty much a giveaway, but um, we'll see. I don't know, I'm, I'm still kind of on the fence if I want to send this in there, um, I don't know. Sometimes my pieces can be a little bit more confrontational. They can be a little bit more right in the face. Um, and that's okay. I mean, maybe that's just the, the blood that's in my veins that comes from my, my ancestors and my relatives. Maybe we still are, um, you know, Lakota, you know, maybe we, we are not gonna stand by um, and just kind of allow things to, to push us around. Maybe we, we stand up, you know, and, and I'm not gonna go to jail <laughs> and do something very um, crazy like what's taking place a few weeks ago in the, the capital of this nation, but um, maybe I'll make a drawing. You know, like everybody, I had felt the tensions of our recent times. I was <clears throat> here at home, I went through lockdowns, all these different things that just occur and we have to change our whole lifestyle around them, right? And I also saw the, the very, very serious and severe impact it left on our community. I know relatives who are no longer here in this world with us because of what took place. And I think about that and I think, well, could these things have been prevented? Um, and I mean, I don't think about it because I don't wanna like anger myself or, or cause anybody else to feel in, in that kind of a way either. But I mean, these are things that we're all aware of. And, and one of the things that came up more recently was really um, pertaining to our checkpoints, our tribal checkpoints. And I can really appreciate the relatives who are doing that and who, who thought of that because um, why haven't we done that? You know, and why, why should we be challenged on, 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 on doing that? Why should the, the governance in our state start to come into our homelands and feel like they can make us bend to what they want? Um, and of course, I could speak about this all day long and, and maybe nobody would even care. Nobody would want to hear me to probably just log off of Zoom and say goodbye. But through an artwork, I feel like people are going to come to it curious. What is it about? And then they start to kind of think a little bit, OK, maybe it's about this or that. But um, I can ha have a conversation more likely with my art than I could ever with trying to talk about anything. You know, I'm not really a person who is about public speech. I mean, I have, I talk a lot and I'm talking today and that's come with a lot of practice as well too, going to school and things like that, like having to do that, having to step up and speak, but I would prefer not to, you know, I would rather just um, be happy with my own life, my family life, but my art, it is out there now and a lot of people look at it and they're gonna accept it anyways now. So I have to be ready for what might come with that as well too, but, I mean, I'm very much inspired by who I am in my foundation as a Lakota, but I'm also really heavily inspired by what other artists have done across art history and uh, European art history, world art history, modern and contemporary art history. And those ideas are, are, are what I really, I think, have more fun with concepts, things that um, other artists have done and how can I feel like I can do that. It's just a way for me to help get my point across. So. Um, I do things like that, like um, recognizing my privilege. I can do a drawing and I can do a drawing of a person and I can say, here you go. You know, you've gained this um, privilege of allowing me to draw your portrait and you can have it. It's an object, it's a commodity now, but I can also reverse that as well too. I can take that away um, if I want to. And then I can frame up this erased drawing and enter that into a show just because I want to not because I, I feel like I have to sell it or I'm trying to 
make some sort of like big statement or anything like that just because I want to do that and um, you know those again are those those moments where we can gain more and more confidence in what we do whatever it is that we're going to do um, but a lot of the contemporary work that I like to talk about is it's really with trying to let people learn you know not everybody is going to be familiar with omitted histories histories that are left out for a reason you know not everybody's going to accept certain facts like the near uh, extinction of the buffalo in the late 1800s and the impact that left on our Lakota people. You know, the Lakota people who are Pteoyate, Buffalo Nation, we see our relatives, the buffalo, not as animals, but really as way much more than that. So imagine seeing their genocide take place. Imagine seeing these piles of buffalo skulls across your homelands. What does that do to you? You know, there's a lot of concepts out there and a lot of um, discourse and talk about <clears throat> historical trauma. And people have their opinions about what that means, you know, and, um, and I think that that's relevant. I think that that's something that we can look into here within our, 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 our homelands from within. And again, what do we do knowing these things and having these different kind of paths and lives that we're, we're going through now? How could we maybe um, change the way things could be done? You know, how could we think better and more strategically? You know, it's not the same as how it was in our, in our ancestors days. We're not planning certain um, attacks in certain ways and like that um, physically. We have to think differently, I think mentally with how we're gonna navigate. So going back to that um, person who brought up the idea of like <clears throat> navigating through education systems, I always tell young students, I'm like, you guys are like uh, warriors, you know, you guys are, are, are young leaders who are going off. Um, if any people are familiar with Zuya, you know, the path that uh, an indiv individual will take, you're going down there and you know, and, um, imagine when you get that eagle feather at the end, you know, that's just the same as that picture of my relative holding his eagle feathers, you know, these things come to you in different ways. So, yeah, I do a lot of these kind of paintings that welcome people in and when they come in, they see something different that they didn't expect. So thinking about audiences, thinking specifically about who my audiences may be, that's a part of contemporary um, art, I think, as well, too. Um, and just really, again, I think recognizing that, yeah, I can't do certain things physically for different reasons. It's not because I don't want to. Um, I'm just trying to think more um, better than, than just reactively and try to think, you know, smarter and, and more clever. How could we look around us in different ways? And, and I make my work for that. You know, if it's my, my work's and go to a certain area and I know who's going to be there, I can lead what um, I want people to think. When they leave there, I, I can have them still thinking about certain things because I already planned for that accordingly by putting all of that thought into my work. So contemporary art is very much about that. It's not very just random. It's not just to the point to like make fun of traditions or anything like that. It's really to, I think, advance forward in the, in the same, um, I guess, spirit of what we would call the avant-garde, really how that all originated from. So it's, it's wanting to challenge, it's wanting to challenge these, I think, different positions of power. <clears throat> and, and I don't want to talk too much about some of these pieces in depth, but if people are ever interested in any of these works, I'm happy to, to, to talk about them a little bit more. <clears throat> I mean, some of them are hard. They're hard. They're not easy to talk about. They're not just there for the for gimmick or anything like that. They really are, are a strong topic that that need that people need to be aware of or to talk about or to discuss or to actually like feel something from. Um, and these are realities. These aren't things I'm making up. These aren't just I'm um, making stuff up. These are things that are actual fact and that are actually happening to us as Lakota people that we're living with and we have to live with moving forward and stuff like that as well too. So I mean this one again you guys could probably understand what this is if you're familiar with what occurred um, a few years back. Again I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to disrespect my little relatives who actually have to go through that. Um, but sometimes it can be fun too, you know, it, it could just be a simple contrast. How do we look at these two different worlds, the, the, the bigger, larger mass world, and then our also intimate uh, Lakota world, you know. Um, this one was a fun kind of memory that I'll share briefly, is that um, I found this bag when I was taking the trash out one time in Rapid City, and I just liked the look of it, the color. And I was like, I, I want to paint something on that. And I thought about it because I know what Victoria's Secret is. And I know they're, what they put out there in the world as far as what their perception is for, for women and for the feminine. Um, but I thought about it differently. And it reminded me like, okay, well, what, 
what would be a, a, a per different perspective, a Lakota perspective of, of, of women? And I thought back to my aunties who, um, I remember the story is that um, one of my uncles brought their, their girlfriend to meet them. And my aunties asked, can she clean Taniga? That was their assessment of, of this woman is valuable. It wasn't her, her appearance really, or what she was wearing. Um, it was more so, can, can she contribute to what we're doing? Can she help make this Taniga? Cause we gotta get it done cause everybody's hungry. <laughs> um, and people who might not be familiar with Taniga, um, I won't really explain it too much, but it's, it's a, um, it's a um, delicacy to some here, especially on the rest. Some people love it. Uh, some people like it. Um, I, I don't know, we can have that kind of just between ourselves who know what that means as well too, okay? But I, I like that. I thought about that and I'm like, man, that, that can be fun, you know? And so it doesn't always have to be very harsh or very like, you know, about a fight or you're trying to pick a fight. It can be just that you're having fun. You know, humor, I think is one of our best um, attributes, one of our best, well, I would even say weapon. You know, we can accomplish a lot more with our humor, with this positive side than probably with the more negative, really aggressive side. So again, thinking strategically, how do we kind of use what we have available to us and really make it work the best it can? All right, so the second topic that my, my work uh, also focuses on, and this kind of came to me um, through life. And I think that this is something that was um, led because of forces beyond myself. I, as an artist, I probably could go out and try to become a community engaged artist or say, I'm gonna work for community and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it probably would have been a different route. Like if I was forcing myself into that, it probably wouldn't have worked the way that it has worked. I think me just kind of um, remembering to be um, attentive to see what's around me and also practice just the, the values that my relatives put into me of like how to be a good relative, how to be respectful and to show compassion and to have humility, you know, don't, you don't know everything, all those kind of stuff. Um, that was just what led me to community engagement. And when I got into it, because for some people, it's, it's not easy work, you know, um, but I love it. it. It's what I can be passionate about. Like, I, I love to see these things happen. I love to see my people happy. I want them to have cherished memories instead of um, <clears throat> whatever, you know, but they can be moments where we can really, really, I think, exhibit what art can be as well, too. And I think we could also use them to help make more people um, involved in art, especially our relatives. But also, we can also um, really, I think, cross over different backgrounds and walks of life as well, too. And, and that's, I think, powerful. So some of the work that I've done um, really comes back from my time when I was in uh, Sichangu, Lakota, Oyate lands. Um, and really the horse, our relative Shunka Waka, um, that nation is what brought this opportunity to me. I can sit here now and I can recognize that. Um, it wasn't me, again, it wasn't about me at all. It was really these um, relatives that are powerful that um, helped make that happen. And it's good because I, I got some, um, I guess, resume. I got some work that I've done behind me but it wasn't just about putting my name out there to say, look what I created. It was really about to say, look what we, we did, look what we all contributed to. So we made a, um, a film and this was like, it's kind of the first community work that led me to working with the, the uh, Sichangu Oyate. But then we also moved further because we have a lot of relatives who are part of the horse nation as well too. So outside of my expectation of I would ever do that, like I never thought I would ever go try to visit all of our uh, tribal Oyate, our tribal nations and our um, confederacy of the um, Ochete Shakoi, but I did. I didn't get to every one of them, but I was surprised to see myself in Spirit Lake. I was surprised to see myself visiting with relatives from Standing Buffalo and up north in, in Canada, who I, I never imagined I'd, I'd meet, you know. So these things are great. And even going back to just here in my home in um, uh, Oglala, Mokoche, I'd go out to some of the relatives that I never knew, like um, one of our, our recent relatives who passed away, um, Chubbs Thunderhawk, uh, very much a, a horse relative. And I got to go visit him at his house. We didn't film him. We didn't film him. We didn't put him in the movie or nothing like that, but we had a really powerful talk at his house. And um, those are memories that are a part of who I am now. Um, but from that film, uh, we were able to create a exhibition and that exhibition was all about the art. And that was again, um, not really 
expected. We didn't think that this was going to happen when we were making this little movie right here. And we didn't even really intend for it to be a movie either. It's just like it all happened because it was like maybe meant to happen. I don't know. But uh, the exhibition, it was a great opportunity for us to just showcase more of our artists and to really get more people who normally would never put their sauce out there. Like uh, um, one of our relatives from uh, Sichangu lands, Mike One Star, real horse relative too. Uh, he probably wouldn't have put his work into an art show, but he, he made a work just for that show. And there's others as well too. And a lot of these people, I think, um, remember this as well too. At this moment, I, um, I do have things that are, are part of this. And if anybody's interested, um, Peter can share the links with you. Like we do have the version of the film, a short version that's um, online. And then I know there's more information out there on the exhibition if people wanna go look at it, but we're, we're working on a film about this as well too. So um, we did that all because um, there was more of the story to tell. And I wanted to make sure that we did our best to try to um, make that available for, for people. It's taken me a long time because as you can see, I got so many things that I do, but I, I'm doing this, trying to make it as best as I can. So I don't want to like rush it through and just put it out there just for the sake of being out there. It's like, if we're going to put it out there, we're going to make it good. But I do want to kind of um, plug that this is coming out soon. It should be out this year. And there's a little link that Peter's going to share as well too. That's a, a little clip from this film. You can actually see the um, exhibition opening where they're all shaking hands in that picture I just now shared. You'll see a little bit more of that um, image from that from that film that's coming out. And there's some really, really good stories that are going to be a part of that, that film. So I can't wait for everybody to see that when it's finally out. Um, the next project that I'm working on is now another community engaged project. And this is really, again, just using what we have as our strengths and, and being honest. Who are we? We're there We are a Buffalo Nation. I'm not just saying that because it sounds cool or it looks like a really nice tagline. It's just exactly who we are. And it's all about how do we structure ourselves as a community. Um, and so I use art because that's what I know. That's what I love. And that's what helps me kind of get to where I go. But I'm um, seeing this image, what I kind of brought up a little earlier, this could have a huge impact, right? It could make you remember um, these moments. But even if you live in those moments, I mean, what's that gonna make you feel? It can be very hard. It can induce uh, negatives. And that's not what I want. It's like, I'm not sitting here to try to make anybody feel guilty or to have anybody, um, you know, lose, you know, hope or anything like that. But we can think about it like this, is that we're gonna be encountering things that are not always perfect, things that are not always positive. That's life, there's this duality. Um, what do we do, all right? Do we um, shy away from it? Do we try to avoid it? If you do that, what happens to you, right? It's gonna keep affecting you. Sooner or later, you're gonna to have to con um, confront that challenge. And that's, again, another lesson we can learn from our relatives, what do they do? You know, and there's a lot of cool metaphors we can think about. And maybe people have even more better stories than I do, you know? Um, those are the hopes that I have is like, how can we look at these elements that are there around us and remember that we're a part of that as well too. So uh, one of the things that I'm doing based off that image is like, okay, I know it. I know what it represents. Again, I could talk on and on and on about it, but I want to change something about it. I can't go back and change what happened in the past. You know, I can't bring all of those Buffalo back, but I can make people think differently today. I can remind them about that. I can make these piles of these Buffalo skulls out of paper um, and I can put them out there in the world, but I can also make them disappear. You know, I can make them so that they're made out of seed paper. And then over time, they're just going to disappear on their own, but not just that something new will grow there. And in that whole process, in that time, we can also explain that, you know, whatever we want, things take time, or that there's always something that changes after something bad. Um, or we can also even invite people to think like, how do we recognize the land? Why is the land so important to us when we acknowledge things, especially now today with indigenous movements and issues? Why do we acknowledge the land? You know, people probably don't think about that so much. They probably just follow along because other people are doing it. But give it some thought, you know, there is purpose in everything we do, especially when we're rooted in who we are as indigenous people. <clears throat> I could make it also work so that, um, you know, I can share more about us. There's a lot of people out there who don't know anything about Lakota people at all, um, let alone me or my art. Um, but through this project, somehow um, things happen and opportunities present themselves. 
and I can think about it like, oh man, that's too big for me. I don't, I'm too scared. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to say no. Or I can try to go into it and say, even though I don't know what I'm doing or it might be hard, I'm going to try to figure out how to make it work because I don't want to let these opportunities pass by. Um, so one of the opportunities that presented itself was to work with relatives in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we did this big event. It's called the Northern Spark Festival. And they wanted me to make this like a project that I can share with all people. And there was over thousands of people who came to this over two nights. And their majority are non-native people. So they don't, like I was going to just see like, who's willing to, to hear our story. When I, when I do these projects, I talk about, you know, our creation stories. I talk about our designs and things about historical um, facts as well too. And sometimes some people might not care about that. But for the most part, I was very pleased to see that everybody gave me time. Generosity. I mean, that's the hardest thing to ask of from anybody is your time. Yeah, you don't want to waste anybody's time at all. So for them to give that to me meant a lot. And I think that also shows too that people are willing to do that out there in the world. Not everybody should, uh, well, I shouldn't assume that everybody out there doesn't care about the Lakota because if certain people were able to do that for me, maybe they'll be willing to do that for uh, more about what we have to do or say. <clears throat> but over that little event, we, uh, everybody, this, this project was meant to be as best because everybody adds to it. I can't do this all by myself. I mean, it would take me a long time, years and years. But if I had everybody help me, we can make it happen. So we were trying to rebuild this um, little pile that night. It was ongoing. Um, and we had all kinds of individuals helping us. We had Anishinaabe relatives. We had non-native relatives. All these people came to it because of, again, art. Art was this, this kind of um, um, unifier that brought us all together. And um, it was good because when I look back on it again, it's not like I'm putting my name way up there in light saying, look at what Keith did, look at his project. It was all about what could I do? How can I share this with others? You know, how could I bring our little students from Oscar House Summer Art Institute in and let them take over that space? And again, it was pretty powerful because that space that we were occupying was right there in downtown Minneapolis in front of the US Bank Stadium where the Vikings play for, for those of you who are football fans. You know, we were right there. Again, kind of probably unheard of to have really any natives take up that space. And not only did we kind of like take it up, but we really did something big there. We got a lot of people to come through. You know, we were kind of carrying some of the voices of our ancestors and our relatives who weren't there as well too. Another project or uh, um, activity that's a part of this project is, is, you know, thinking about different media. How can I try things? So not everybody might want to make a paper buffalo skull but maybe they will have a few minutes to just trace a stencil or maybe they have more time to go in there and paint it to make it really something more. So I'm trying to think of like what I can do to help bring art to people. I can't expect people to come to me saying, Keith, can you help me to learn art, to learn more about art? Sometimes I gotta go out there, um, even force myself to go out there sometimes because it's not, again, not easy work. Like I was saying, community engaged work, you really gotta wanna do it. Otherwise it's, it's gonna be um, probably harder for you. If you're not wanting to do it. But again, people were um, taking part. All these people came through. Even if they only have one minute, I have these little stencils and I say, here's a Sharpie, just trace that. You're part of it. You're part of this. You have, you add it to it. You know, you make somebody feel uplifted and like they, you know, encouraged, like they did something that was um, contri contribution. Um, but for the most part, I've seen everybody, when you just give them one minute, they want to give you more. All right. And even the little ones, we took this to the um, Anishinaabe Academy, which is in Minneapolis, fourth graders. We took over their little um, auditorium and they loved it. And, and we see these things, it's nothing new. I didn't create anything new at all. It's just like, if you ever see a little one making art, look at what they're doing, look at how they changed. It's medicinal, it's almost healing, you know? And art can be that in whatever way that you are calling it art, whether it's painting or drawing or um, making a, a meal with your relatives, making taniga, um, <laughs> or who knows, maybe it's your, your jokes that you tell. You know, those can be um, what we would call like um, transcendent gifts. These are gifts that are given to you and, and they're, they may be our talents as well too, but these are things that you have that definitely can be a part of art. Um, and here's just a cool image that we were there for the Indigenous Peoples Day a few years back and if you've ever been to Minneapolis, you know that there's uh, Franklin Avenue or Street, I forget, and that's kind of like the Indian part of, of the town. 
but we, we were able to close down that road and take up the roads. So we're making art right in the middle of the road. And, um, it's really cool because this one lady back here, she was walking back from the dollar store with her kids and it was pretty cold that day. And I said, hey, do you want to take part in this? And it's kind of hard to ask people things sometimes too, because you might be like really burdening them in a way, right? But she, she was like really pushing me off. She was like, nah, I don't want to do that. But then I somehow talked her into it. And she, I was like, does it only take one minute? Just trace it. So she did. And here she ended up sitting there for over an hour on her own. So I just gave her a bunch of art supplies that I had for this project. I gave them to her to give to her kids as well, too. But now she has her piece on there. And that's one of the cool things about this one, too, is when, when we actually see it. Because I intend to have these in an exhibition someday. When they're all done, I want to see all of this there so that everybody can say, hey, I'm a part of an art show. And look at my, look for mine. You know, you kind of search for things. Um, but I'm very happy to bring this down to where I'm at at OLC. And with that, I bring new opportunities. Like I try to bring what we don't have available to our, our relatives and to our students and our communities. And I try to say, how could we um, make these things happen? So a lot of the times it's not just because I'm getting paid for it. You know, chances are I probably really ain't getting paid for it. I'm probably just doing it because I want to do it but it's also because I want people to feel like at least somebody's doing something, you know? It's like, we can all do nothing, um, but at least maybe we can try to do something. So this one here is making t-shirts. And each t-shirt, the way, I, the way I bring it is that it's one of a kind, an original artwork. It just happens all by chance, but you get something really cool out of it. This lady out here was from Pine Ridge um, Village area. She came to the college center when we did one over there and she's uh, talking about her son. It's like, these are all his favorite colors. And she made that for him. And then I was like, look at that, you know, you can't buy that right there. You know, you couldn't even come in today expecting that you would see that or that would be made. You know, there's something that's creation right there. And we can say that that's in a way uh, sacred. It's well come, you know, creation is. Whether it's something like this or something bigger, something, something more um, exact in our culture as well too. But it can be this as well too, I believe, like even something there. Cause I mean, look at the um, attitude of people. You know, no matter who they are, their little kid or, you know, a teenager who probably doesn't want to be there in the first place, but how you change their attitudes, maybe you make them feel like they're um, willing to do something more. You know, maybe there and you have that opportunity after that to talk to them a little bit and say, hey, what about if you try this, you know, or something like that. Instead of, I think, our approach of being very harsh sometimes, because it could be maybe harsh to, to tell somebody you need to learn your language. And that the way it's kind of like translated, it might sound too difficult. But if you find a different way to set up that, um, you know, how you talk to them, that discipline maybe, uh, maybe there's a way that you can cushion that a little bit is what, what I'm thinking. And again, um, some of these parts of our identity, that geometric that represents the vertebrae of the backbone of the, the buffalo, and what does that symbolize? To me, it symbolizes the matriarchs, our unshis again, or our tuis, our aunties, or our mothers, or our cousins. So when I see uh, young women like this, put this on the back of their t-shirts and hopefully wear it. And then if somebody asks them about that, they can explain that. That's like passing on cultural knowledge right there. All right, so the final um, point of my work is what I call cultural significance. And there's a lot of different ways that I consider this. And I'm just gonna share one example really today that I'm working on currently. And I was inspired by really my life, you know, and what I think is the most beautiful parts of our life. Um, how do we create these communications and these relationships to, to others beyond just our family or even just to another human? But how do we really make these connections to, to what it means to, to truly, I think, continue to exist beyond our times? Um, and that would be, I think, in spirituality, really. Um, and I saw a piece here by Oscar Howe. And I always remembered it that when I, when I saw it because I was really thinking about what was he making here. And I heard him, or I read what he had said about it a little bit as well too, but it got me thinking that, you know, where is there work? And when I look at our artwork, especially after like the ledger art period and really more into like contemporary art, what are artists making? What's their work about? And I rarely kind of come across any pieces that were like this. And this one's called Calling on Wakantanka. It's, it's very, very powerful. So it, it made me think, well, how come as artists, we aren't doing things like this? How come we aren't really showing that these are um, as important as other issues or other little memories and things like that as well too? 
And so my work began to really um, encapsulate that. I, I need to bring some of these ohunkanka, uh, these creation stories into some of the work that I do, even if I don't have to explain them to everybody. Um, it's really that I'm leaving it there. So hopefully somebody will come across it at some point and, and at least have that available because there's so many bits of knowledge that, that just um, vanish. When they're gone, they're gone. And I mean, a lot of what we have that is a resource for us today, it comes from sources that are not us. You know, some other has written this or recorded it for us and we accept that and we kind of adopt it as the way we, we continue that uh, tradition onward. So I'm really trying to encourage other relatives, especially the next generations to think about what are they gonna do in their time? Because the world changes fast, right? Rapidly, things are changing quickly. Uh, so what are we gonna do? And I think, well, again, use what we have, use it to your advantage, be, um, you know, very, very creative. How can you take what you have and make it work for you? What if you have a language that exists all in symbols like emojis and reactions and all these little cool things like that? Um, how do you maybe make it help you? So that's kind of what I was looking at when I created my thesis work for my, when I was in my master's program. And it was talking about the Lakota creation story, the creation of the universe, which is out there. You guys can find that information out there in the world. Um, but there's also the intimacy of how is that story told through the actual uh, oral traditions. You know, who's telling the story? Because they're an artist too. The way they're telling it, the way that they're putting that into your mind and you're visualizing it, that, that's an artist's work right there. So I'm just thinking about, well, what's visual art? How could we bring that in there? Not so much just illustrating it, but really trying to tell that story through what I do as, as visual art. So um, I used uh, some of the, the figures, our, our Wakan relatives, to help kind of bring that forward because I know a lot of people respond to figurative work, representational work. If I did something abstract, it would be a little bit more difficult. Maybe someday I can get to an abstract version of this, but for starters, I wanted to use something that I think could help me right away. Um, and I used relatives from USD as my models. So in a way, pushing them up there too as, as being honored for who they were. You know, they're gonna be the future leaders as well too. They're gonna take care of the next generation. But if you're familiar with our, our story, um, these figures are Ia and we, and I won't really explain them. I'll, I'll kind of leave that for, for those who, who know what that is. And then we have Maka and Wakia. And this was my first time really um, focusing on oil painting when I was at school. So I'm also using it as a chance to try something new, to try to gain a new skill and to try to get better at it. You know, just try to make myself get stronger as an artist. Shka, um, sometimes we refer to as Daku Shka Shka too. Um, and then Hokbe, or sometimes they say Hokbe. <clears throat> Hawi um, and Kate. So these are the figures that are there at the beginning. Um, and it's cool because when I did this work, I just did it because I wanted to do it. This was my time to focus on what I wanted to do. Um, I involved these, these um, students, and it was, it was fun to share the story with them and to let them know the importance of who they were actually portraying. Like, um, cause some of them didn't know this, but I think afterwards they kind of understood what that, what that is. And they probably carry that now where, where they go in life. <clears throat> but from that, um, the pieces were actually acquired by the Akta Lakota Museum. And that again was really cool. It was another one of those milestones of like career wise. It was really, I didn't expect that, but I'm thankful it happened. Um, because at least they're there, they exist, they're going to be available for future generations to see. But when we were talking about actually showing them now for the first time after my, my show, because my show was only up for one week, um, this led to the development of an actual exhibition that's coming out this year. And I got to bring in some of my other artists' relatives, and they're all creating their um, expressions or artworks based off those relatives as well, too. So it's a really amazing show and I can't wait to see or for everybody to see it. I mean we have John he was here too. He, you guys need to see his work. Makola James <clears throat> you gotta see his work but all these relatives and then we're thinking of them as diverse too like how do we make room for everybody to be a part of this. You don't have to just be Keith's best friends. <laughs> um, everybody's my best friend but I'm um, trying to make time for, for all even our Dakota relatives even though this is based off of a Dakota creation story our Dakota relatives understand who these figures are. They have their, their language still and they refer to them, but maybe it's a chance for us to, to talk together, you know, and hear more of their, their stories. You know, their stories are different than our Lakota ones, but 
there, there's no better than, you know, either one of them are, are not better than the other. You know, we make time for each one to, to be heard. And I guess I can give another little plug or preview, or maybe Peter will be more better to do so, but I believe next month, um, and Peter will, will say it maybe, but next month, I think we're gonna have a winter camp uh, event, which is gonna bring our artists to talk about their works in this project. So you can see, I think two events that are gonna have our artists talking about their work. Okay, so very much at the end now, and I, I wanna kind of just conclude because we're very much at the end. Um, that my work is really about honoring and appreciating my relatives. That's what it, it's always been about. And that's what it will continue to be about. And I do that by putting that in my work. So maybe I'll, I'll paint my, um, my ancestor, the first Braveheart. And I'll think about just things that I want to think about, right? I mean, I don't think he would probably scold me too hard for putting him in a painting like this, but he'd probably question it, you know, if I ask about what it's, what it's about, but, um, Maybe it's these little relatives at USD, you know, all of them to just feel like proud to see themselves in a painting, right? Normally, who do we see in things like that? Privileged, wealthy, people in power, you know, but here we have our, our little young relatives and look at their, I guess they're pretty cool, but I know they're definitely excited as well too. You know, sometimes you try to play it off like they're not that excited, but these guys were. Or maybe it's my actual, uh, kinship relatives. My Tumi, my, my eldest, after my uh, Unchi left, this is now the, the matriarch. She's the eldest um, daughter of my grandma, Mercy Iron Girl, if any of you guys know her. Uh, and then her great granddaughter who will someday be a matriarch herself. You know, and I just painted them because I, I thought it would be fun. And I did this just because I wanted to play again with those ideas like, yeah, food is very central. Everything we do as Lakota people, we don't eat, we feast but sometimes maybe they want to go to rapid city and eat you know um things like that so when i did this painting i didn't expect for it to do anything i just had fun with it it was the last one i would ever expect would win an award little did i know when i entered it at the um native pop art market in rapid city a few years back it won the best of show my first best of show ever and it came from this piece here so again i don't think it was all because of me it was probably because of my relatives really they're responsible for the greatness and the good things that come my way. <clears throat> or maybe it's my niece, my, 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 my youngest niece. I always tease my sister because when my, my niece right here was a baby, I used to babysit her all the time and she used to call me mama. <laughs> so my sister really didn't like that. Um, but yeah, she was really close to me. Um, and now I get a chance to tell her more about her history. I can tell her about Wounded knee. I can tell her about our, our ancestors who were there as well too. Um, my grandmother's grandmother, Elk Woman. The stories that come from that that not a lot of people know, but maybe she can uh, feel like that's important for her to know because if her uncle's painting it or something like that, then maybe she should know what it's about. Or little kids who I don't even know, um, but I will call them little relatives in Rapid City. They're not on the res. This is at the Doll Art Center when we did a show about the Buffalo Nation. And they sent me this picture and all these little kids that they took over there who are, I mean, look at them. That's okay, get up there and touch my painting. You don't have to be scared of it. You put your hands on there if you want to. But to see themselves in some sort of way, even though it's not really them as a model, they see themselves in some sort of way in this piece. And that's letting them feel like, yeah, they are a part of something. And really this art isn't just only about what I want it. You know, it's not just an object anymore. It's almost like a portal in a way to help different things happen. Or maybe it's all those artists that I really looked up to that um, I saw for the first time and I saw their names on, on their labels up next to their artworks and stuff like that. I mean, I consider those relatives as well too, really much a big part of um, what I think about as far as today. You know, that's why I work with so many rel um, artists is because I really um, feel like we are that, um, we're related in a way. So if you guys are familiar with the dream catchers, this would be another topic we would talk about with uh, Lakota Ochete Shakoni art history. These guys were doing some good things in their, in their days as well too. Vic Reynolds, if you guys remember, Vic Reynolds is, is gone now too. Robert Freeman is also, but um, Bobby Penn. So yeah, I always looked up to these guys and their work and I just wanted to do a painting just because I appreciated who they were and what their artwork did for me. Or maybe it's a self-portrait and I paint myself or I paint my son and I put him into my work now. You know, I probably won't put them into a lot of my work, but 
I did so here. And now he can have that memory. Whenever he's older, he can see wherever this painting is out there and he can kind of maybe think about it, at least have some sort of a, a memory too about me, maybe if I'm not around. And of course, again, the community work, bringing in all of those who normally would never work with art at all and making time for them, you know, not feeling like it has to be uh, exclusive. You have to go to school. You have to go all this whole route. You have to be very lucky like Keith was or whatever to be an artist. It's like, no, those of us who do make it to that um, line at the as, as a career or whatever, we got to turn around and start to think, well, who's back behind us and how do we kind of bring them up as well too? So again, it's all about how do I put my relatives into my art, whether it's actual object or if it's this, if the art is us being together. So that's my um, presentation and talk today. So thank you again, everybody for being here. I do appreciate all your time and just for giving me uh, some of your attention. Uh, the last few slides are just opportunities are available for whoever might want them. Um, I think that these are great. These are some of the ones that I took part in and they're very much um, just um, excellent opportunities. I would, I would really encourage all of you to consider who might be, um, who might benefit from these. They're all for youth, high school youth. But we have a um, Oscar House Summer Art Institute is still running. It's every summer. And here's the application deadline and the um, link. I'm sure you can revisit this Zoom if it's recorded and catch that information. There's also another one, a new one that just began last summer. It's in Fargo, but it kind of comes from that Oscar Howe legacy as well too. So these are, are great. They're all paid for. It's, they're free. All they got to do is just apply and then if they, I'm sure they'll get in and they have to make it over there to wherever they're at. But um, yeah, and then also OLC, I mean, People might not think of the arts when they, they think about OLC, but we have a, a graphic arts program. And myself and um, our other instructor, Marty Tubles, a junior, we're the two art instructors and we're happy to work with our students and really anybody. You don't have to be an artist if you wanna just take a class and, and we can help um, share what we can with you. I mean, that's what we're here for. All right, so again, Wopila, thank you guys all. Have a good day. Um, I really appreciate it sharing today with you all.